I'm going to do my, my classical uh, Eurovision intro here, as I do uh, every time. So uh, now it's uh, a couple of minutes past uh, uh, half past eight. Uh, and I want to say welcome to all of your uh, you attendees to Stockholm, actually. Today. Normally, I'm uh, used to be in Gothenburg, but today I'm in Stockholm. And uh, what we will go through this morning is a super interesting topic uh, regarding the current status of the AI hype cycle, but also uh, industry funds' thesis on investing in AI. So I want to say hi and welcome to Rebecca and Patrick from Industry Fund. Hi, Peter. Really great to be here. Um, and uh, we were talking, for, for those of you who joined us uh, just a couple of uh, minutes late, we were talking about uh, investing and how the, the transformation or digital uh, transformation we've gone through the last year with, with turning into digital meetings and Zoom has affected, uh, affected the industry and that the, uh, investment, uh, the investment managers at different funds can do a lot more meetings but there's also technology a technology transformation going on that we will dive a bit deeper in today and Rebecca you are the, the uh, writer or author of this thesis and you've done a, a real proper work here to present the industry funds AI thesis here so I'm looking forward to hearing you present that. All right. Thanks so much, Peter, for letting us present and inviting such a great panel. So really exciting to discuss with you guys. Uh, I'm going to start off like running through uh, our thesis fairly quickly, I hope, and uh, then really looking forward to jumping into questions. Um, so called quick intro to me. I'm an investment director at Industry Fonden, focusing on uh, transformative technology and, uh, and applied AI. So let's jump into the AI hype cycle and uh, the current status of it. And I mean, in the past few years, artificial intelligence has, has really turned into a big hype and we see it sort of plastered on every second pitch deck and um, almost to anything remotely related to AI. And uh, we've always seen AI going through different hype cycles. Uh, but we think that despite this hype, we really believe that the best opportunities are yet to come. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that is uh, and also what we look for in applied AI companies. And we really believe that AI also has the ability to truly transform and solve some really significant problems. All right, so let's jump into it. This is what I'm going to run through as part of what I've written and the paper that you can read on Industry Funders website. Uh, okay, so why do we think that we're not going to go into a new AI winter, but actually uh, stay and even <laughs> apply AI even more going ahead? Well, first of all, the fact is we have almost 60 years of research related to AI, which means we have more mature algorithms. And there's also significant advances that have happened in just the past 10 years, showing progress, for example, within natural language processing and computer vision. And um, um, there is an immense amount of data out there. And we also have a lot better data infrastructure. So we're able to <laughs> use the data in a proper way and also store the, the data a lot cheaper than before. A funny anecdote is that IBM released the first gigabyte storage in the 1980s and it cost like 40,000 US dollars and it was the size of a refrigerator. And I mean, these days you can store like a terabyte of data at Amazon for like $20 a month. So it's a huge uh, transformation in terms of storage. And the last point that is really important is the access to open source libraries that uh, have really sort of accelerated the development and deployment of AI. And there are global giants like Google um, with TensorFlow and LinkedIn releasing Apache Kafka, but also local players like AI Sweden and their data factory that have done a tremendous job opening up and enabling applied AI in a new way through these open source libraries. 
Um, so yeah, I'm really positive that we have this great foundation and that the AI winter will not come this time. So we are a fund that is not scared, actually really likes doing research-based uh, uh, technology investments. And um, our mission is to create the industry of tomorrow and believe that the science is sort of the technology of tomorrow. So to understand a little bit better what's to come within applied AI, we spent some time looking at the research we have and what research and what universities stand out today. And um, I'll quickly run through what we came up with. Um, in terms of data-driven life science, something that Patrick uh, that I have with me is really passionate about and has worked a lot with. We think that Sweden has some really interesting international um, level research, both within research related to precision medicine and diagnostics, and also research that can be used for drug discovery. I mean, one example for this being applied is our own portfolio company, AMRA Medical. And uh, there are many universities working on this, like Chalmers University, KTH, Karolinska and Lund. Uh, and there's uh, several great researchers and professors. One example is Emma Lundberg and her team working on sort of the intersection of uh, artificial biology and to explore the human cell biology and um, has a really cool uh, way of doing that and sort of engaging citizen science, uh, which is really, really cool. We also have the recent advancement that I was really excited about when it came uh, just a couple of months ago with deep minds gigantic leap in solving protein folding. And I mean, this in combination with state-of-the-art Swedish life science sector, I believe could solve some really, really hard problems such as curing Alzheimer's and Parkinson if I'm allowed to dream. So really exciting. Mm, moving on to natural language processing. Here there are several universities that have great research team, but one that really stands out is Uppsala University and Johan Nibre and his team has done some state-of-the-art research in this area. And a lot of the research that we see, we believe can be used to turn human readable text into knowledge structures that are then able to be used for machine processing. And I mean, this is vital to take yeah, the next level in, for example, conversational AI and create voice first systems. And I really believe in the voice first revolution that we will use voice a lot more because we already see that trend in audio we want to listen so the next step is we want to communicate through voice in in um, transportation solutions in with our um, electronic uh, with our robots whatever it might be um, we also have of course information analytics related to natural language processing and how this can even contribute to accelerating research in itself and so much has happened in this area uh, and the last research area I want to talk about is robotics and then computer vision and image recognition. And in robotics, KTH really stand out and there are several great research coming from, for example, Professor Hedwig Shellström or Professor Danika Kratschik doing a lot within spatial computing that is really cool. And uh, here we expect a lot of applications to come out of this and hoping for robots being used even more in, for example, healthcare or performing really advanced surgery. Um, we also believe that the spatial computing uh, projects that we've seen can be used for almost science fiction kind of applications, you being able to think uh, and then re in that way interact with your uh, uh, appliances or your robots or whatever it might be in the future. So I think Sweden actually has a good chance of maybe even challenging Neuralink, who knows. Uh, and then within computer vision and image recognition, you have Lund and Linköping uh, coming out with some really excellent research uh, related to diagnostics, being able to interpret x-rays and ultrasound images. And further applications are, of course, within autonomous vehicles and, and several applications within agriculture and precision farming. And we've already seen applied companies coming out of this region, or Lund, for example, with Mapillary is a really great example. So, and we're hoping for a lot more to come. 
So that was a little bit about the research area. And then what specifically do we look for when we look for applied AI companies? And one recurring issue is meeting companies trying to do too much of a horizontal uh, solution, competing with the big tech giants uh, and not, you know, being uh, having insights enough on a specific problem and a significant problem. So we believe that the biggest uh, winners are the ones starting off with a vertical solution and and also solving a really significant problem and having like really deep insights on what the customer's pains are. And in addition to that, one um, barrier to competitors is definitely, oh, I lost my video there, <laughs> is definitely having proprietary algorithms and proprietary data, but it's not a must, but it can be a barrier and it can create value in the company. And also having, of course, sufficient, oh, it keeps going off, sorry, having sufficient data uh, as well. And in the future, some of these vertical applications might have a horizontal uh, application in the end, and they might be the biggest win winners, but not starting off in that way is our belief anyway. Um, we also are really excited about deep learning, but we also believe that deep learning has been quite overly hyped and it's actually taking longer to commercialize due to several issues with you know, high demand and computer power, computing power and other issues. But we think that, of course, deep learning could probably offer the most transformative applications. Um, but I personally believe that we are quite far from reaching a general intelligence um, today. Uh, and then the last area that we are really excited about is companies making AI work more practicable. So providing the infrastructure tools that you need to qualify data, because we often talk about data being, you know, the new oil, but it's not, you know, the right data and quality data is what matters. And then you need the right tools to be able to, to find out what, what your <laughs> data is like and validate have automations in relation to annotation and literacy. So that's something we're really excited about as well. Um, and then from another angle, we are always looking for applied AI companies aiming to solve these really significant problems. And to give some examples, we believe that AI can be part of minimizing the negative climate impact. And uh, there are several AI ap applications that could be part of this, such as optimizing the energy usage in different sectors, improving efficiency in manufacture and agriculture. And then AI being used to improve our health, obviously, with diagnostics, with pre to predict negative health indicators. So you can have a predictive approach to your health. And then AI being used to improve education is something I believe a lot in, still, you know, a lot left to do there, but you can create a lot more personal education tools that can help, you know, make education available for anyone. So those are just some of the areas we want to encourage more applied AI companies to take on. And then to finish off with sort of what do we evaluate when we look at applied AI companies and what is our litmus test for, for the companies we meet? And I said this too many times now, so I think you're starting to get it now, right? So they need to solve a significant problem. And I think it was, it was Einstein saying that um, the formulation of a problem is just as important as its solution. So spend time on the problem. And then of course, do they possess quality data? I mean, garbage in, garbage out, right? So here you know sometimes access to proprietary data can be a competitive advantage and also enough data so you can even create a data moat against your competitors um and then do you have the right competence and people and then i number one is the right people to understand the customer pain points but also understanding how to apply ai to solve such a problem and then the last point that I think is super important and will become a hygiene standard in investing in AI companies is evaluating sort of ethical criteria in relation to applied AI. Uh, are they considering these aspects? Are they closely monitoring potential bias in the data that they're using? 
and we encourage companies to look through EU's ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI and make sure they build their companies with this consideration always in mind. All right, so just no final note. I really believe that just like with electric power, it was really hyped in the beginning and it took like a hundred years before it's, it was fully uh, used in the factories, but it completely changed. Uh, and it created sort of a second industrial revolution once the factories started replacing their steam engines. And AI has been overly hyped and we're going on 60 years now. So <laughs> not really a hundred, but almost. And, uh, but I think many companies are, companies are now ready and that we will see uh, AI solving some of the really significant problems and, and shaping this industry of tomorrow that we want to be part of shaping. So that was my final note. So thanks so much for listening. Now into the fun stuff, the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. And, and I know there's uh, some real proper work behind this thesis. What I find very interesting uh, in the area is that you're, or in the thesis, is that you're also talking about the industry Fonda's mission, where it's about shaping the industry of tomorrow for Sweden. But you're also taking into account the massive need for funding in, in deep tech. And uh, for example, you have an example of, of DeepMind and their, their funding that they get more oh. funding than the uh, total Swedish or, or Swedish uh, Council of Research. Uh, oh. kind of Many times. On, on, yeah. yeah, I think it was four times uh, when I looked. So, so is, is doing vertical uh, or by building vertical applications the solution or what else do we need as a part of the solution to be able to, to stay competitive in this area? Yeah, I think that's a good start, at least, like focusing on a vertical where you can actually build a really great uh, product that can solve an immediate problem for companies. And then eventually you might be able to expand it horizontally. Um, and I think we also need to consider sort of inviting more international research teams coming here and, and building their companies here and thinking uh, how we can make Sweden an attractive place to start your company. That's also an important aspect, I think. Yeah, uh, and, and both uh, you and Patrick is, is kind of highlighting the need for Sweden to turn into a deep tech or, or a research based yeah. uh, country of entrepreneurship. Uh, have we seen that switch yet? Do you see that in, in your deal flow that we have more uh, deep science or deep tech related uh, startups now? Maybe you want to take that, Patrick. Sure. I mean, uh, I think the simple answer is yes. Uh, I guess us as a fund, we've been around for many decades and we've been backing deep tech type of <laughs> entrepreneurs and companies over the years. Um, but I think the, talking about hypes, I think we have a new hype potentially that entrepreneurs want to get into, uh, you know, uh, building technologies that solve real problems, uh, you know, out there in the big world. Uh, and Rebecca touched climate, health. I mean, these are topics that are top of mind of young people today. Um, so we're seeing the shift from entrepreneurs who have either done a journey in the tech space generally and take a dive into some deeper vertical uh, with deep AI or um, even hardware is hot mm -hmm. these days or the combination of the two. Um, and I think um, we have had a great growth of accelerators and spin outs and an ecosystem growing out adjacent to academics. Uh, and also, I think we are lucky in Sweden um, to have the mandate for researchers to actually go and spin out projects. And that's obviously different from other countries in the world. So we have an advantage there. Uh, but I think what, what we now try and foster learnings from the tech community into well, the deep tech or the applied deeper technology areas, um, those learnings around how do you build a team, how do you scale, how do you go global, how do you stay bold, um, and I think there are some other components we uh, are looking to see, uh, more stamina, we, we belong to a category of investors that have the lack of being flexible in terms of stamina, because um, these projects often take longer, uh, mm -hmm. I've been in the healthcare and life sciences space, typically a 10 year lifespan isn't necessarily or even shorter for some investors, uh, uh, three to five years, it's not necessarily the ideal time frame to evolve and go big with a big, big um, entrepreneurial dream. So I think there are multiple um, uh, aspects that come together that 
form a bit of a perfect storm for us right now. So we're really looking forward to seeing more and more entrepreneurs getting into these deeper technology areas. And maybe as, as an addendum to that, I mean, we're not alone in an ecosystem in Europe. Uh, just recently, uh, we had a launch of a, a European initiative to really bolster uh, deep tech initiatives uh, in Europe. And we've had a great influx of grants in Europe and also in, uh, in Sweden. And that obviously catalyzes uh, and gives the opportunity to entrepreneurs to take, take the risk, uh, for instance, researchers, to take the risk and jump from a, a well-paid well salary uh, and, and a, you know, a stable, <laughs> stable job to something insecure. So I think that also helps that transition. Um, so a lot of components uh, are looking great now, right now. Yeah, yeah. I definitely we see that in the, prof I think all of the professors I mentioned, almost all have their own company as well, so. Yeah, and I think we see that we need a, a, like a higher uh, or putting the spotlights on the, the professors that actually do entrepreneurship. Uh, if we compare ourselves to, to for example, Stanford, where where uh, they have to almost have a company. Uh, and, and it was really interesting for, for uh, those in the audience not looking into the Scale Up Europe launch. That was, I think, two weeks ago. The, from the Euro Com uh, European Commission, they were really highlighting deep tech. They were really highlighting uh, AI, uh, blockchain as as research areas, but also areas where we need more commercialization from from Europe. Uh, from your perspective, do you see in Sweden we've spent a lot of money on research traditionally or historically, uh, but uh, going international, we also have a uh, we also have a reputation that we're not that good in commercializing research. Uh, would you agree on that, or or is that just a, a a theorem that doesn't uh, really uh, consist with the, the reality or, or align with reality. Rebecca, why don't you go? <laughs> um, I think we have seen some really great examples of companies commercializing uh, research and proving that wrong. <laughs> I mean, like Mapillary and like our company, several of our companies that have been successful. So I don't know if that's too much of a generalization, but I also think we may might need more support as well getting from sort of the research and the fir in the first phase setting up your company building the right team and getting that first funding even maybe even before you have an mvp or when once you have an mvp and i think there's been a bit of a gap there in the really sort of early stage research based companies um yeah. but if i can uh, ship in i agree totally agree with rebecca and i mean maybe to then be generalizable. I think we are solid and very great at science and product. And generally, I mean, if you compare with other uh, mm -hmm. cultures, we are less good at selling, mm -hmm. but I think we have the key advantage. And I think um, uh, several companies that we've invested in, um, a few in healthcare and life sciences have been very early on thinking about how to internationalize. And that also means that you bring on board international competence with serial entrepreneurship or, or selling and marketing skill sets, and also how to go about with your go-to-market model. And that is utmost important because for us to really get these moonshots that can go global with a product, that really means that you need to get out of your local market pretty soon. Mm. And the other advantage we have in the Nordics or in Sweden is that our domestic market is just a pilot market. Uh, but it's wonderful in terms of an openness, uh, most of times, we have access to loads of different types of data uh, and competency. And many people want to want to be here. I think Spotify is one example of, you know, people want to come to Stockholm and, and work here. And these days, digit physically, I mean, we can do it from anywhere. So I think that's another aspect that we need to be able to attract that talent uh, to be able to actually globalize uh, research and products. Um, to, to actually have that impact that we are hoping for when we're investing. Yeah, and, and talking about openness and talking about internationalization, one thing uh, we also do have and that's often mentioned is that we have a very strong industry or are strong in, in many industries ourselves. So, so we have leading companies within, within telecommunication, IT, life science, automotive, 
And I want to jump into them now uh, because what we're going to do now is that we're going to have a, a panel discussion. But first, you will get to meet the the panelists, and then we will have a panel discussion for um, about twenty minutes or, or fifteen to twenty minutes, uh, and then we will uh, end the, this session with questions because I know there's uh, questions coming in the Q and A session, and you can also use the chat. So we'll end the session uh, with this one, but. Talking about industry, I want to uh, jump into the health uh, and healthcare industry and life science industry, uh, because that's one of the themes you're mentioning uh, a lot in, in what we think the future uh, could behold for Sweden or what we're, where we could be very competitive. So Ebba, I want to welcome you to stage from Ebba Carbonier from Sui Life. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, and, and thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation here, Rebecca and Patrick. And um, my name is Eva Carbony, and I work as a portfolio manager within the strategic life science program, SWE Life. And I have a portfolio with the um, large national projects, for example, gene sequencing, the data part for gene sequencing, and cell and gene therapy, and prevention of childhood obesity and biobanking. So it's a wide range. And um, just to, as, a, as a reflection here, can we start with some reflections, Peter? Yes, yes you can. Um, it's, it's very interesting that uh, we might be a little bit stuck here in our sort of uh, 200 year old medical history uh, where we still spend almost all our resources in the sick area. So, so this is perhaps something that we uh, have a, a very large opportunity within uh, in Sweden and also our, our image of the Nordic countries, not just our image, we, we actually live it as well. So I, I want to, I really want to discuss and, and point towards also the opportunity here of this system transformation. And, and there it's important with the incentives and payer models and business models, because of course, all our business models are made for the, if we, we look at it from a healthy risk sick perspective, the, the business models are made for the, the sick part. So to say, and from a, I will come into some of the some of the projects that we're doing in, in within the genetics and the more predictive modeling, but from a fact based point of view here, why should we perhaps look more at prediction and prevention than just diagnosis and treatment? Is that um, we really we we can we can prevent 80% of the burden of disease. And it's actually, a, so, so what is then the economics of, of prediction and prevention? It's actually a one to six ratio. It's not a one to two or one to three, it's a one to six ratio. So since our health is paid for by the state to large extent in Sweden, we should really in, invest even further. And, and AI is, of course, perfect for this prediction and, and prevention uh, to invest one crown rather than trying to fix health and pay six crowns. And we only still spend 3% on this prediction and prevention. So. I think Sweden, we, we have a very good opportunity and the Nordic countries, we can be really leaders in, in this. Uh, and not to say Peder, of course, our, our fantastic um, um, pharma industry, of course, we shall go on with, with uh, for example, our cell and gene therapies and, and biological, uh, Parts, we, we have so much to do there still, of course. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. But if we look at the one to six ratio, I mean, where should we invest more than 3%? And perhaps I can go further into some of the projects that we're doing there. But that was just some reflections to, to start off with. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Eva. And, and talking about uh, prediction and um, uh, prediction and, uh, and medicine and pharma, Peter, I want to welcome you because I know that you're uh, doing a lot of work within this area at Astra. Yeah, definitely. So data and digital is now really shaping the company as it stands today. It's, it's a foundational part of our company strategy and it's now deeply embedded in the ways of of working and especially in R&D since we've always been a science driven company. Um, doing so we generate a lot of uh, uh, scientific uh, data and have done over many uh, years and thousands of trials and experiments. Uh, so it's, it's a treasure chest if, if you may and as uh, VP and head of, of data office, my job is to make sure that we can leverage that and, uh, for easy access and responsible use to make sure we get more medicines to patients. And I just to pick up on um, both uh, the thesis, thesis and, and um, whatever I was just saying, I think one of the key things that, um, uh, that you mentioned is don't, uh, uh, you really need to make sure that you're solving a, a, a clear problem. Uh, and I think it's absolutely essential that uh, don't have business come to AI, have AI come to business as part of a toolbox to solve opportunities and challenges. And it's really a cross section of skills and tools that is required to get that mix so that you really get uh, value out of it. So what we have done is, is build um, data science and AI skills uh, across all, all functions, essentially. So it's, it's really ingrained in, in the way that we do business. And then we have a hub that helps to make it uh, easy to, um, uh, to access and use the data assets in a responsible way. And some of the priorities that we have uh, in applying this um, is the early and now increasingly non-invasive prediction and diagnosis. Uh, so even allowing to diagnose patients before they experience symptoms, or you can see it in, in, a, in, a, um, in a scan. So things like that is uh, where we uh, apply it and prioritize it. Optimizing study designs uh, to make sure that we can increase the probability of success and, and speed um, accelerating our research part with um, AI-driven targets and, and molecules are other examples. But the, the drive to, to go as early as possible and, and to, um, to uh, uh, eliminate the, the, the causes uh, is, of course, the, uh, the overall drive. If and, I may ship in, yeah, because I think it's a super valid point about it. Race. And thanks, Peter, for the for the uh, uh, insights into AstraZeneca. I mean, my background is also an associate professor in data sciences, and I've spent a lot of time actually assessing healthcare systems from a payer perspective. And then, but to your point, I mean, our healthcare systems and payer um, uh, setups are not geared towards how to reimburse and find pathways for preventative or even earlier detecting um, uh, signal, signaling technologies uh, in healthcare. That's, that's a fact. And I think that's why we see such a tipping towards, as you say, putting more money towards maybe pushing certain cancer patients another three months rather than trying to uh, look for you know, earlier detection, for instance, in cancer. We have an example uh, which is clear cut, you know, where we're building uh, many of our AI investments within this department are building markets. So coming to the point of how do you go about with your go-to-market model? Well, you need to have stamina to build that market out. One example is an AI platform in neurogenerative disease. The company is called Combinostics. It's essentially AI platform for healthcare to de detect pre-MCI stages of uh, Alzheimer's disease. I mean, this is what memory clinics across the world is trying to do, because uh, we know by now research is showing that there is there are interventions pro for preventing progression in disease. And we have a famous professor at Karolinska Institute, where I'm my alma mater, um, who's who's done top research in this area. But how do you get that into the healthcare system, and who pays for that? 
um, we had a, one of the biggest um, challenges in aging disease and still we haven't really figured out how we can incentivize and start paying for it. If you look in South Korea and Japan who have this problem acutely, they have aggressive reimbursement pathways for these type of innovation. So, I mean, we will have to change. <laughs> Probably we'll have to change faster. I, I totally agree, uh, Patrick, and, and thank you for, for great comments there. And, and just like you're saying, we have to change faster because it's not sustainable, the costs that we are seeing, the increasing costs. So the, the incentive and the payer models, um, just like you're saying, we have to start showing uh, and also learning and, and having more evidence, of course, on, on the health part. Because what we're doing, for example, is, is uh, some health bonds, working with some health bonds to start off with, because for Sweden's future capacity, uh, it's not far-fetched then that it could be interesting with health bonds from the pension funds because it's such long-term outcomes that we're looking at. So it's not um, three months, it's 10, 20 years. But I also uh, see very good initiatives, and, and of course we're trying to initiate this as well, that since we have uh, a fairly healthy start or a situation in, in Sweden, we could also, with, with, for example, our gaming industry and uh, health applications, why shouldn't we do, or rather, why should, we, should King do Candy Crush? Why shouldn't we do more of addictive health applications and really addictive health applications? I mean, there are, there are applications, but we should invest in even more. So there, so answers to your question is that, of course, there are many paths here in, in increasing and also the, the payer models from the regions we are starting to change those because of course the regions cannot withstand the, the increasing costs for the disease part. And just to, if, if more portfolios looked at this healthy risk sick perspective, okay, how much do we invest in the healthy part and how much do we invest in the sick part? Just to start off with, you know, the percentage there, that's a good start as well. So we have to drive innovation also in, not only in technology, but also in business management and, and how we do, how we set up our business models also, or governmental models, then you say, Eva. Yes, definitely. Um, and it's, all the way, I mean, from an um, operational, tactical, strategical point, perhaps some of you have heard, for example, within uh, New Zealand, it's got to do all the way up to how we measure GDP. Because if we, if we are more sick, GDP increases because we consume uh, healthcare. And if we produce more medicines and sell more medicines, GDP increases. But is that a healthy population and, and a sustainable, healthy country? Perhaps not. You, you all know about US that very large cost, but the, the years that they live is decreasing. Okay. So they don't get output from their investments or rather their, their costs. So um, it's really what, what New Zealand are doing is that they are having a framework for the, the state long-term initiatives and strategies and investments where you have to look at um, the, the impacts, not just the financial impacts. But I'm, I'm very keen on also saying that we can make money on this part in Sweden if we start systematically doing this system transformation and with for example pointing then our 
AI projects towards prediction and prevention to a larger extent. And I will come to a part with the genomics side, because of course there are very, very interesting, very interesting potential within the genomics. So I shall keep it there. Peter, final note on the life science block, and then we move into the, the manufacturing industry. <laughs> yeah, just to say that we are gearing our investment to this, uh, even though there isn't a uh, uh, model for it uh, yet. So in, in cancer, for instance, earlier uh, prediction and de detection and then continued response because uh, cancer drives resistance and then you have to um, then you have to solve for that too. So there's a load of, of investment going in to go as early as, as possible. And as I by saying, using genomics, using um, other AI techniques with imaging and, and things like that too. So there is very big investments uh, and advances in this uh, space. And talking about advances and, and, and transformative sectors, uh, Robert Walton at the Volvo Group, uh, you you are representing an industry now with uh, that are in in very a very transformative state. There's a lot of things going on in the mobility or automotive industry, and especially on the, the truck side with the electrification and um, the self steering trucks. Uh, what's your and Volvo's take on the thesis and, and the work with AI? Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I would say that it's very interesting that you noted, Rebecca, the minimize of climate impact at the same time as we have an increased need of transports. So here I would say, as you pointed out, AI can really help to transform. And uh, I mean, traditionally, if you look at Volvo, many people connect AI to R&D, the product side. But we have a clear focus to go more on the service side. I mean, half of our revenue is the ambition is to come from services. And here we have a great opportunity to utilize AI for predictions, for uh, actionable insights, decision supports, and optimization. So transforming from the product, the driver operator, into the, so to say, fleet or business and the operation. So... In this, a great opportunity, Peter. Yeah, yeah. And, and what are you doing uh, within Volvo? Because you're representing uh, Connected Solutions. You do a lot of work uh, within the field of, of AI. What's important for, for you when you're both when you're developing your own AI solutions, but also looking at, uh, for example, startups uh, that are doing AI solutions? Yeah, and, and to put it in a, in a context, uh, I'm heading a center of excellence for advanced analytics AI with one clear purpose. We have over 1 million connected customer assets like buses, trucks, construction equipment, sending data 24 seven. And our mission is really to unleash that value with advanced methods and tools like AI. And uh, here I would say working in the AI ecosystem is very important working with partners, working with academia, and not the least startups. Uh, and I like the points that you pointed out, Rebecca, because we do need to have like a lacmos test uh, in this collaboration and to see how this can fit into the bigger puzzle. And one thing I would like to highlight is that we do need to have a value focus. It's quite easy that we go with a technology focus, the perfect AI model, but we need to understand why we do this, not how. And also that we have a usage perspective. I've been in many pitches where I see in a great AI model, but when they show how it will be used, you need to have a PhD actually to run this dashboard of what it is. And also that we get the trust into the equation because some user will downstreams use this AI solution and will they trust it if it's an unsupervised model or it, will it be reacted? But coming back to your question, I would say startup can really fulfill a great thing here uh, and to complement, to add on. Uh, and of course, we also see this uh, uh, need of having a vertical approach. Many startup 
have reached for the complete chain, which is a bit uh, hard. There are no silver bullets. Uh, and also many startups reach for handling the data because if you have the data, you have all the possibilities. But here we can really work smart in the ecosystem since if we have, uh, there are data, of course, in our perspective, it's the customer data. So we need to uh, see if it's possible to utilize it. But we have data in the data factory in AI Sweden, for example. So there are many possibilities to, to address the data need. Uh, and talking about data and talking about a company and uh, a group of individuals uh, trying to help the industry uh, apply AI. Martin Rukfeldt, I want to jump to to you and, and Sentian, the work you're doing. Um, what, can you just quickly explain Sentian and then uh, your comments on the thesis? Sure. Um, so my name is Martin Rukfeldt. I'm the CEO and founder of Sentian. Uh, and what we do, yes, that's a quick intro because you Sentian might not be as well known as Volvo or AstraZeneca or so. Uh, we, we do um, industrial AI solutions. Um, we have a very ambitious uh, R&D roadmap when it comes to AI and managed to, to do quite a few uh, of these technical breakthroughs that are, are needed in order to, to build certain types of, of solutions. And what we do is we, we offer products in the industrial space we have. Uh, one product uh, that is uh, for improving control systems effectively and optimizing them. So both for manufacturing and, and the process industry where we can increase the yield. And as mentioned before here in the in connecting it, it, it also can then reduce energy and uh, impact on the environment through reduction of chemicals and, and things like that. And uh, so, so that's on one side. Uh, the other product we have is in in more pure mathematical optimization. Uh, it's it's a, a product that we apply to logistics, uh, to planning and, and supply chain. Um, and um, so, so that's a little bit background to, to who we are and what we do. And, and I'd like to just connect to, to what Robert said and that there are some very interesting uh, uh, challenges that we're facing. We, we're coming up on these solutions that are require people that have a, a PhD in, in computer science and so on. And I, I think that's a natural state uh, to where the market is. Because if you, if you see it uh, starting from research in the universities uh, and in research uh, bodies, then coming to usually consulting and, and analytics implementations. You, you have to experiment, you build your POCs. And, and it's natural that these solutions become a bit bulky and, and, and difficult to control and they're built up and we aren't so experienced. And what we are seeing now is the first real products that come into play. And hopefully that will solve some of those problems where, where people have thought enough about the uh, uh, problem and, and spend enough on the solution of the problem that they can build a product for it. And, and where you then do not need a, a PhD to run it on a daily basis and, and really get it to, to, to work. And I think that's an important thing, but it is related to this phasing. So I would see that most companies are still doing a lot of, of testing today. Uh, you doing POCs, uh, and, and trying out and doing an analytics. And, and not that many companies have come to the state that they can really work with products. Uh, and on the other hand, when we do get these products, um, it will accelerate because it can then be used not only by the, the AstraZeneca's and the Volvos, which have the budgets and the size to, to do these kind of things, but also by a little bit smaller companies, eventually all, all the way down to really small companies when it's really... Uh, uh, taken that uh, step that it's become uh, very productized in the end. Um, so so that, that's one of the, my reflections uh, on what's been said. Um, another one is that I'd like to just point out that uh, we talk about, uh, about the startups and, and that we need to get all of the data. Uh, and that's, that's true in many cases. In other cases, uh, the data is with our customer uh, or, or the, 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 the startup's customer. So 
to and, and the large companies they have the data they are actually in a fantastic position when it comes to ai because they usually have huge amounts of data and they can use it and 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 then uh, exploit that and it's much harder for startups to, to do that because we usually don't have data from the beginning we have to create it so um the worry i see is that a lot of, of big companies may may not see the urgency of using the it doesn't feel the pressure yet but as in in also with the internet uh, section when that came on board uh, a lot of companies were a bit slow to start off and then were hit by the small one that had had time to build up uh, or the ones that were innovative and, and and used the internet technology to their advantage and really used it so i'm, I'm seeing a, a bit of a trend here in this in sweden that uh, there's not quite enough pressure uh, um, to use AI yet in the, in the big companies, even if they do have the data. So, but that, that may have to do a lot with the fact that they're probably not organized to take risks, um, uh, that they, they avoid that in general in, in large companies, uh, trying to both have the efficiency and innovation. And obviously they are rather versus rather than and. Uh, so if you, if, if you really want to look at this, you should probably go into areas like looking at probabilities of your projects, saying, oh, we have 50 projects and we probably will succeed with really well with five. Uh, and taking really the model of the, the investors that say, we will have a, a few moonshots that really work and, and a few that work so-and-so, and then quite a few that won't work, that will go to the PUC graveyard or the uh, these kind of things and and uh, uh, in this world I, I think these larger companies can benefit from working with startups obviously with that's obviously my business so <laughs> um, but um, yeah that that's a, a reflection on this uh, yeah great may, may I make a quick reflection on Martin's reflection uh, yeah we're just going to jump quickly to connie and then you can uh, we, we have free reflection after that uh, but connie uh, one book and one topic we've been talking a lot about is the the crossing the chasm here uh, because we really need to uh, be find the the uh, space in between innovation and operationalization so uh, and you have a background you are new at ai sweden or pretty new now uh, you are heading up our head head of trans ai transformation but you uh, was working at uh, driving digitalization driving ai adoption at cgi a consultancy firm and you've been working in all of these areas what's your take on the thesis yeah, I, I think the thesis had a lot of great points and as all the um panelists here have, have pointed out AI and the potential of it is, um, is, is huge, but that also means that we need to look at AI not as just one thing. So uh, are we doing continuous improvement? We, we, we talked a lot about you know, real value here and that is really good. I also like that the thesis say, you no, know, we should look into vertical solutions because that is more easily to focus on one problem but I think we need to, as I work in the area of AI transformation, we need to look at the bigger systematic change and, and where this AI solution, what is the context around this? Are we transforming uh, internal work at the company? Are we transforming a market? Is it continuous improvement in one process or is it continue, or is it improvement in the, in the customer service or, or, or product? And all these different things, uh, requires that the startup or, or uh, the, the AI solver needs to have abilities to understand the whole ecosystem. Do we have the, the right partnerships? So, so I don't think, so, so AI is a different beast from other technologies because it affects much more different parts of the organization and ecosystem. So I think that means that we need to be better at collaborating with each other so so the startup doesn't sit and kind of it's it's crucial that they are you know working with partners that sit on the data as we've talked about but also the the industry players that maybe you know build the other tools and ecosystems around that and and so i also liked in the thesis where it mentioned you know the whole market of all the tools around ai to get it operationalized and all that so it's a, it's a big ecosystem. So I, I think that that's why when you have an, a great solution to a problem, that's not enough. You have to understand the market. You have to understand 
what what is the whole ecosystem and the, the, the transformation that needs to happen for this to uh, actually deliver the value. The, the AI solution itself is not enough. Uh, and, and that I don't, I, I, I see we can do some improvements on that. Yeah, and Robert, to your comment. Yep. Uh, or first comment, uh, Conny, I would say value first rather than AI first. Yeah, yeah. of course, yeah, <laughs> always. But what, what I'm saying is that the value it is not always enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that, that is the problem because if you can't apply the value, there is no value. No, 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 I agree. And I mean, it's a combination of data capabilities and, and some sort of business need, business question to solve. And, and coming back to Martin's reflection, I uh, just a reflection about the data. Even though if there is a lot of data within Volvo, for example, a lot of the data is belonging to the customers. So here, uh, it's of course a delicate question, what we can use and what we need consent to use. Sure. So, um, and that's the thing that I have every day actually, looking into what data can we use connected to quality issues or if we need a new consent. Absolutely, I, I totally agree with that one. Uh, it's always tricky with who, who, who is the data belonging to and, and how do we do that in an ethical and, and, and good way. Uh, and we also see that certain countries where uh, they have a more liberal, uh, should we say liberal uh, take on whose data it is and, and what's personal and, and uh, also very much compared to Europe with our GDPR, uh, we take China. And, and they are now getting ahead of the rest of the world uh, when it comes to AI. Uh, they haven't quite taken over the US yet, but they're on the path to do that. And the large part is because there's so much data and they are using it very, very aggressively. Uh, and that gives them uh, advantages. Uh, they can build new products faster uh, and, and there's also one other interesting aspect compared to VC investments that are very, very different from, from the Chinese take on this uh, to, to the Western world where they approach it by, in, in Europe, we, we say we focus on one thing and become really good at that one thing, while Chinese companies often go for the whole value chain and they want to be involved everywhere. And, and really take completely different take on how to, uh, to, to use uh, in the market. But that's obviously a digression, but it's, it is related to how you approach these big challenges when it comes with, with AI and bigger projects with AI. I so agree, Martin. I maybe shout out because I've been an entrepreneur myself in the data aspect of healthcare. I mean, Nordic Sweden is the best place on earth if you wanna go build AI in the healthcare space. We have, we were first out uh, digitalizing uh, electronic medical health records. Uh, and we have collected registered data since the sixties and we can combine those through personal identifiers. So as long as you do it rig rigorously um, with a research flag and you go through those checkpoints, I mean, it's heaven. <laughs> so all, all entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs to be uh, go chase data in this sector. Yeah. Well, I you can... must just uh, uh, make a little note there because I have been and am involved in a few uh, uh, medical uh, AI ventures. Uh, one in predictive healthcare uh, for primarily dialysis sector. And that was a challenge to get data from Sweden uh, because all of the data sat in various systems that weren't easily accessible. My The CEO of the company said that getting data into that system was, was really like uh, uh, putting into a shredder. Um, and, and that's not ideal. So uh, the other one was what was mentioned before that the, the business model of Sweden was very, very difficult to, to deal with. So we actually did our business in the US uh, because we couldn't get any uh, one to pay for predictions, predictive healthcare. Um, that wasn't interesting with the ones that had the budgets. Agree. There are still problems to be fixed, like interoperability. But that's a worldwide problem, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Right. Time flies when you're having fun. And this is a super interesting discussion. Uh, I think this is a discussion that we need to continue uh, because it's it's very important also from for, for 
Sweden and to strengthen Swedish uh, Sweden's competitiveness. Uh, do we have any final comments before we uh, wrap this up? Rebecca and Peter. Good. Thank you so much for all the really great reflections on the thesis. This is so helpful for us because I mean a thesis from us shouldn't be static. It should always be, you know, evolving with feedback from people. So this has been so useful for us. So thank you. And I look forward to discussing it further, this uh, system transformation that we have the potential to do as well in Sweden and in the Nordics. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I also felt it would have been fun to discuss even more how Volvo and large companies can let in startups and give them access to the data and maybe not always do invented here. I'm not saying they are, but like we really need close collaborations between the large uh, companies and the smaller startups. That, that was actually going to be my last bill that uh, we, we, we share both data and infrastructure uh, today and, and have that as, an, as a value uh, being offered and perhaps we should even do something uh, with uh, with um, with capital uh, because there is a lot of uh, ideas being operationalized uh, in the big uh, companies that is not necessarily hitting the, the market so perhaps there's more potential in that one thing for all of the participants is that within a month, I can promise you, we will have an event with Industry Fund, with BioVenture Hub, or next month, I would say, uh, with BioVenture Hub, that's Astra, and also Mobility XLab, uh, who's uh, Volvo's kind of entry point to, to for startups. Um, and then Swilaf, Eva, you will be with us there as well, talking about the life science. So guys, thank you so much for joining me here today. Uh, this. Uh, webinar will be available later as well and you will soon see a new uh, event invitation coming up into your in your inboxes so have a lovely friday uh, and i hope to see you soon again thank you so Likewise. much thank you so thank much you. Bye. Bye, bye bye very nice meeting you